Tim Cohen has done decades of research on Bible prophecy, but decades of research on the identity of the Antichrist. And 20 years ago, I produced his program on Sid Roth's show, and the information on the identity of the Antichrist was unbelievable. But in these decades that have gone by, there is even way more evidence. Now, I know you're probably saying, oh, could we really know who the Antichrist is? Well, my guest says yes, absolutely, but there's a stipulation in scripture that allows you to figure out who the Antichrist is, and he'll be talking about that. But what's been happening with this individual behind the scenes, the Antichrist? Things have been going on, but people didn't really know it. But Tim is going to be talking about that too. He talks about scriptures that I have never seen on who the, the lineage of the Antichrist and who the Antichrist really is. And what is the trigger that is going to bring the Antichrist into power? Okay, Tim, in 1987, you asked the Lord to show you who in Revelation 13, 18 was talking about. Okay, take it from there. I'm sure. So I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy at the time. I had been a believer for less than a year, you know, as a Messianic Jew or a Hebrew Christian, whatever you want to call me. And uh, I had read through the New Testament two or three times completely and through a good portion of the Old Testament. I got to this imagery again in Revelation 13, this beast of the feet, be, uh, beast of the feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, uh, to whom the dragon gives his power, throne, and great authority. And and obviously such a thing doesn't exist in nature. Genetic engineering was pretty primitive still at that time. And so I thought, okay, this doesn't exist, but obviously God's word is literal. So what's it talking about? And I asked God to show me who and what that was talking about. And of course, in that same chapter, when you get to verse 18, there's this uh, statement about making a name calculation. So uh, right after that, I had lunch with uh, Monty Judah, a Messianic pastor in Colorado Springs. He was the assistant pastor of the Messianic congregation there. And this was a Shabbat, Sabbath. And uh, at the lunch, he showed me uh, an unofficial version that was clipped. It was partially cropped, so just part of it, of uh, Prince Charles' coat of arms. And then he pulled out an English name calculation that he and some of his friends from Martin Marietta had produced on a computer program. And so what they had done is they'd written a program to use the, the biblical numbering system, but in Hebrew, it's called the gematria. You know, as it's been transferred in this case to English sequentially, they took that and they put the names of world leaders and royalty and so forth, all the ones they could think of that were prominent into that program. And only one got spat out as 666 and it was Prince Charles. So Monty looked at uh, some local libraries, I believe there in the Springs and found that book that on the cover had, you know, a, a partial, uh, a partial uh, crop of Prince Charles heraldic achievement, the unofficial one. So I went back to so the, the, the coat of arms then. Yeah, it's actually called an heraldic achievement, but it's it's uh, more loosely called the coat of arms. OK. Yep. So, you know, and it has devices and so forth. So if you hear me using heraldic terms that don't make sense, just ask me. <laughs> I've read a lot of books on heraldry. So back at the academy, I went to that library and decided to try to find books on Prince Charles, books on heraldry, particularly the latter. And I found, uh, you know, a bookshelf that had, you know, I don't know if you can see me here, but, you know, maybe twice that many books, you know, on a shelf, <laughs> not a lot. You know, and there are hundreds and hundreds of books at that point, even that had been written on heraldry and published. I found the one book in the world that had Prince Charles heraldic achievement, the official one, the complete heraldic achievement <laughs> toward the center of it. And that was Boutel's heraldry and uh, published, I believe, if I remember right out of London, but it was the only one. And so I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I began to research the prints from there, you know, kind of top down. And uh, out of that, 11 years later, 1998, came the Antichrist and a cup of tea, but I was already working on it heavily at the academy. And in addition to that, I told classmates, you know, God has shown me that I have to write a book. I was also working on something else at that time already, which has morphed into my Messiah history in the tribulation period multi-volume series. That'll probably be the last thing I put out or close to it. Uh, my my uh, my greatest work. And yeah. you, but you have so many books and materials on uh, the end times. I mean, it's amazing. Your research is ah, amazing. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, that series covers almost the totality of scripture, other than something like church governance, on which many, many good books have been written. Uh, but the Antichrist in Cup of Tea was originally only an appendix to that tome. It became too large and it was too important. I decided this needed to come out sooner. And that way down the road, you know, with the evidence being out for so long, nobody's going to be able to gainsay it and say, well, you're just saying this because he's in this position or doing this. Right. So. Yeah. But, you know, okay. But other people will say, oh, you know, other, they, they'll say how the Antichrist could be Prince William or Juan Carlos was 666 or Nero was 666 or maybe Soros will be 666. I mean, why, how come it's uh, just uh, King Charles? You know, unfortunately, we live in a day and age when there are so many quote unquote Christians and very few of them are actually grounded in scripture. You know, they, they think, oh, Antichrist, evil figure, somebody who's going to be like a Hitler. Oh, I wonder who's evil in the world today. Who could that be? Oh, yeah. Soros, Bill Gates, uh, Barack Obama. You know, oh, Hitler, he's dead. OK, let's move on. Who else? Who else can we pick? Right. Right. That's about as far as the reasoning goes. And if it goes any further than that, they might try to uh, say, OK, does this calculate to 666? What system can we come up with? to make the name work out to 666, right? What can we contrive or invent or what seems reasonable to calculate to 666? All of that is completely antithetical to what scripture says in regard to the Antichrist and how he's actually identified. So some, there's some very explicit criteria in Revelation 13 that must be met. And the same thing uh, in Daniel chapter seven. And if it's not met, you know, if somebody meets one item out of, uh, let's say half a dozen or a dozen, whatever it is, that person does not qualify to even be considered as the Antichrist. So, for example, when we talk about Prince Charles' sons, William and Harry, the one thing they both have that their father has, now King Charles III, is the lineage, right? If anything, they've got a lineage that's even more diverse than his own. So, you know, from that perspective, you could say, okay, maybe they're a little more qualified, right? However, when you look at all the other criteria, they have none of those, and their father has all of them. So that that initial point is irrelevant. It means nothing. But the criteria don't even include the lineage in scripture, right? The one thing that we would think of logically and rationally as Christians and those who are well-grounded in scripture is that when the Antichrist comes along, since he's going to deceive the whole world, per Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, both, all the nations are going to be following this guy. For them to delude a nation like Israel, you know, into thinking that he's the Messiah, the word Antichrist means counterfeit Christ or in place of Christ. And of course, Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word for Messiah. Christos, you know, in Greek, probably not pronouncing that right. And Mashiach in Hebrew, they both, when translated to English, mean anointed. They are the same word. One is Hebrew, Mashiach. The other is um, Greek, Christos, Christ Messiah. So when they think of the Antichrist uh, in that sense, he's just a counterfeit. And they might look at the lineage and say, okay, he's got to be able to deceive Israel into thinking he's a descendant of King David to say, hey, I'm your Messiah. He's got to be able to deceive the Muslim world ostensibly into thinking he's the successor to Muhammad, the Mahdi, you know, what they call their Mahdi. Uh, in this case, we've got the lineage and then in, and that's, that's it. That's not specifically stated, though, in Scripture. What is stated, and this gets to the root of your question, yep. is in Revelation 13, it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So there's a beast involved, and it's the number of a man, right? So before we can do the calculation, number one, that imagery of the beast, whatever it is, has to be associated or in some fashion present with that man. If it isn't, no matter what system we use to do the calculation, even if it's the right system, and even if we're doing the calculation the right way, doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Right. It has first to have the foremost, imagery first, which yeah, that, that I didn't realize until I was looking at your materials and that, and the imagery is in Daniel and Revelation, correct? Yes. And in fact, portions of it are in other places in the scripture. Okay. But, but the bottom line is uh, the imagery being present for that person is the authority to attempt the calculation. Without the imagery, you can't do the calculation in context. It's meaningless. The second point is we're not free to just invent a system for the calculation. 
everyone almost, almost without exception. Monty Judah obviously would be an exception, right? I'm an exception. Almost without exception, everyone who's ever attempted to do a calculation for anybody, including the Pope, all these different Popes, to say, well, you know, yeah, 666, look at that, <laughs> you know, like Vicar <laughs> or something like that. Wow, he might be the Antichrist. They've invented a system that isn't the biblical system. Okay. So again, meaningless. How do I know that? Well, the English is translated. It's not the original scripture. It's a translation. And in the Greek text from which the verse is translated, Revelation 13, 18, in both the received text, the Textus Receptus, and the majority text, not the, uh, the NU text, but the received and the majority, which means the majority of extant Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, you know, original Greek manuscripts, the number 666 is not written in the form of words. It's given one letter for the number 600, a second letter for the number 60, and a third letter for the number six. In other words, the actual system for the calculation is what's used to specify the number 666. And in that, in that way, the system we're supposed to use is identified for us. And historically, it, as it turns out, it's the ancient biblical numbering system from Hebrew transferred sequentially, not phonetically to the Greek language. That tells us something more. It tells us that the system itself can be transferred sequentially to any language to do the calculation natively in that language without tampering with the name, without having to translate things, right? So we can do the native calculation on the biblical system in an authorized way. And as it turns out, the title, Charles, Prince of Wales, by which Prince Charles has been known globally all this time until just the last few days, calculates to exactly 666 in more than one language. Even on one language, that's close to impossible. You would struggle greatly to find anyone's name in history that calculates this. And I'm talking about like a biblical formatted name, you know, like Jesus of Nazareth, Prince Charles of Wales, you know, King Jesus of Nazareth, Mashiach Jesus of Nazareth, you know, whatever. But it's, it's usually a place associated with it, right? Like a first name, a title, a place. It's the same format for Charles, Prince of Wales or Prince Charles of Wales. That title work out, works out to 666 in both English and Hebrew on the original system, you know, as the name spelled in the modern Israeli press. Mathematically, that isn't even possible, but it's a fact. Now, okay, again, that's incredible, but it would be meaningless without the imagery. Now, explain so, the details of the imagery. So there are two beasts in Revelation 13. There is the beast that comes out of the sea, and after that, the beast that rises out of the earth. Christians have, you know, Christians, theologians have looked at that historically, those who studied it and said, well, we think Mortem's the Antichrist and the other one is the false prophet. That's generally how it's understood. And I believe that's correct. So the beast that rises out of the sea, the first one is beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, to whom a dragon gives his power, throne and great authority. That dragon is identified in the prior chapter of the apocalypse in Revelation 12 as a red dragon or a fiery red dragon and as the serpent who deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden and explicitly named Satan in Revelation 12. So it is Satan himself as a fiery red dragon who gives this beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, his power thrown to great authority. That's the first beast of Revelation 13. And I'm not going to get into the second one. I, I do address it in the Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. And by the way, folks, I should tell you, this is all in my book called The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. First published in 1998. The second edition is coming out soon. And you can order it now from Prophecy House, the publisher, on a pre-publication basis. So in a few months, it'll be out. It's very close now. So that being said, the first beast again. Uh, Prince Charles' heraldic achievement was first shown to the world in July of 1969. And again, I'm at, going to say that's the coat of arms. So, and, and, yes, thank you. Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, people think of it as coat of arms in, in heraldry. They call it neuralgic achievement. Yeah, they mix the terms. But uh, yeah, so it was first shown to the world and unveiled to the world in July of 1969 at his investiture as Prince of Wales in Caernarvon Castle, a large open air castle, the most famous castle probably in the world, because it's also the castle of King Arthur and Merlin historically. It is that castle, you know, in mythology and so forth. And uh, something that I'm showing in the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea 
that I don't think anyone else has ever heard is that that castle is laid out, its structure is, uh, meaning its towers and its walls and the location of the towers, the, the geometry from above of the walls and so forth to mimic the old city of David, the original city of David atop Ooh. Mount Zion. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? And uh, so at the investiture, this is July of 69, in uh, 1953, the nation of Wales adopted the red dragon as its national symbol. It was a major symbol in Wales the whole time, going back to the Romans that occupied ancient uh, Wales, what is Wales today, and then ancient Britannia. And from there to the Romans that occupied ancient Judea, they had these, these uh, what they called them, um, red dragon or dragon banners that would whistle, you know, as they would ride uh, the horses to battle or this kind of thing, the Romans did. And that morphed into the red dragon that became the dragon of Wales, the one that's now on their flag, you know, and their national symbol since 1953. In 1958, uh, Queen Elizabeth II declared that she would make, she, she declared that she had created her son, Charles, Prince of Wales, and that in the future, she would present the, him to the uh, Welsh people at a formal investiture as Prince of Wales. And that's what happened in July of 1969. Both she and Prince Charles were facing the red dragon as the coronet was placed on his head to coronate him Prince of Wales or Prince of the Red Dragon. And that is where his uh, coat of arms, his heraldic achievement was unveiled. Now, I find it very interesting that you said that exact, and I looked at the um, that dragon on mm -hmm. the flag of Wales, and you mm -hmm. said that that exact image is what John in Revelation would have seen. It is. <sighs> Yeah, I find that very amazing. Now, um, also, can you talk about how uh, the British monarchy claims to be the lineage of um, King David? Yes. Let me make one more point, though. Okay. I talked about Revelation 13. In that chapter, that first beast, which is the beast that's being talked about for the name calculation in verse 18, that same beast rules for three and a half years. Same period we see in, Roman, uh, excuse me, in Revelation 11. For the period of the great tribulation in which the two witnesses will testify and torment right that's revelation 11 it's that same period of time but in daniel chapter 7 in the old testament this person who rules for three and a half years is not just a prince of roman lineage a prince who is an heir apparent to a throne a specific word for prince used in the hebrew meaning not just any prince but someone in line to be on the throne that prince not only is involved in, uh, in Daniel 9, verse 27, two chapters later in enforcing or confirming a covenant with Israel, or that's what Christians think. So I'm going to come back and correct that later in this interview, what it's really about. But in Daniel chapter 7, this person is identified with completely different imagery. The same individual called the little horn with the eyes of a man. In context, in ancient uh, Babylonia, for example, they would have immediately understood that that was a unicorn with human eyes. Hmm. Now, I mentioned the beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion being on Prince Charles' coat of arms. And the red dragon, by the way, is also on his coat of arms. It's actually on it. The red dragon of Wales, the red dragon that the Romans used. Uh, but, uh, and that's completely unique to him, by the way, in history and in heraldry. No one's ever had that before. Right, and his children had don't lions, have that either. No, they've had lions or lion leopards on the heraldic achievements, but not uh, where it went further to have claws like those of a bear. And I'll circle back to those claws because I've got an interesting anecdote for the second edition on that. But in Daniel chapter seven, this little horn of the human eyes or unicorn of the human eyes, well, guess what? That's on his arms too. That's not completely unique to him in history. It is unusual in heraldry. His own mother's heraldic achievement, her official coat of arms has normal, a normal uh, eye like a horse would have where you don't see any visible sclera, no visible eye white, and a round eye socket, not a V-shaped human eye socket, right? The unicorn on Prince Charles, official and unofficial arms, both has human eyes with a V-shaped eye socket. So uh, he has the full combination of imagery on his heraldic achievement. No one has ever had that before. No one can ever have that again, the way that he does. Heraldic achievements are unique to an, inter, an individual under international law. Their coats of arms are just like they're unique to corporations or countries when they're granted. 
There's a whole set of international laws that surround those things. And in addition to that, when you're talking about a royal heraldic achievement, it's produced by combining part of the emblems or the symbols, the devices of each parent's heraldic achievement, if they each mm -hmm. have one. Kind of like when you know the egg and the sperm come together to make a human being, to produce a unique human like that. And then they add some unique symbols for the individual, in this case, the red dragon for mm -hmm. Charles as uh, Prince of Wales at the time. Now, let me also make one point before I move on to the lineage. And that is people are asking now that he's king and no longer prince, does that mean he's not qualified to be an Antichrist anymore? Interesting question. It is. But the answer is no, he's still the Antichrist. The whole point of all that imagery in the calculation was to identify the person. Mm. He was identified back in the 1980s already, you know, by Monty Judah, by me, uh, initially Monty, then right after that, me. And then, of course, God led me to all kinds of other things, including the lineage that I'm going to talk about here in a moment. Monty didn't yet have that. I gave him that. So uh, God used us both. And in that regard, um, we have identified Charles as the Antichrist. And he's been identified all this time. And most of the church has had their head in the sand saying, well, what power does he have? Uh, right, right. He seems like a loon or a goon or a, and not you know, doing a zany much of guy, you know? Yeah. Who's going to ever take him seriously? Well, guess what? He's been the number one globalist on the planet since his investiture in July of 69. Bar none, he has been the most powerful human being in the world the entire time behind the scenes. Everybody internationally takes him so seriously that they bow to him practically. And I'm going to circle back to that. So his lineage to begin. His mother, when she was coronated queen, was coronated uh, queen of thy people Israel, quote unquote. Her lineage atop it, her official lineage published in London, which is very detailed and it's offered through Prophecy House. I'm not just saying this. The chart is available with the book for those who want to get it. Her lineage shows uh, Queen of thy people Israel, the royal house of King David. They explicitly claim to sit upon the throne of David, the British monarchy does. And that's been taken seriously enough in Israel for it to be announced on national television that Prince Charles is a descendant of King David. That happened before the first edition of the book was published in 1998. That could not happen unless there were uh, rabbis in Israel behind the scenes saying, okay, who can we look at who's got a lineage we think we can verify who might be a descendant of King David since our temple genealogies, you know, the genealogical records were destroyed with the second temple. What are we going to be able to come up with now? And that is what they came up with. And okay, what's amazing to me is that you said they announced that twice in Israel? At least twice, yeah, before, before 1998. Okay, and they've never done that with anyone else, correct? Not to my knowledge. I haven't heard of that being done with anybody else ever, not even his sons. Okay, so repeat again. They announced that he Is was... a descendant of King David. Okay. Why would they do that? And then uh, on top of that, from his... But, lineage, which actually mm -hmm. would then make Israel trust him more to be their Messiah. You would think so. But mm -hmm. then the monarchy did something very strange. They never made an official visit to Israel ever until 2018. And then they sent William instead of Prince Charles. All the visits that they made were unofficial until that. I saw the, I saw footage of that, uh, those visits and everything. And it looked like he was like going from different, the different religions trying to unite them. But then I thought, oh, well, then people are going to think, well, he's the Antichrist. But of course, he doesn't have all that imagery and he doesn't calculate to 666. But why did they send him? Well, Prince Charles did make an official visit after that, and it was quite a stunner what happened. So I'll, oh. I'll also come back to that. He, he did something very incredible, actually, uh, in Israel. So, uh, but back to his lineage. So he claims to be a descendant also of Muhammad through the Hashemite lineage, which is the line of descent ostensibly from Muhammad, like Jordan's King Hussein, like Iraq Saddam Hussein before he was killed. Yeah, Prince Charles is of that same lineage. And behind the scenes, he converted to Islam uh, under a guardian of Islam, one of the most powerful um, Muslims in the world. He received an honorary doctorate in Islamic studies from um, the university there in Cairo, Egypt, the most powerful seat of Islamic learning in the whole world. So Prince Charles is the most popular Westerner uh, from anywhere in the world. 
to the Muslims of the Middle East and has been this whole time. And that was true. I, I mentioned that also. That was true even at the time I wrote the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. He has no peer among Westerners so far as the Muslims of the world are concerned. And um, so he's got those two things. Then he's now, as King of England, head of the Anglican Protestant Church. Can you imagine the lack of spiritual discernment for the Anglican Protestant Church to put the Antichrist as their head? And that is what they have just done. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. Wow. And that's going to be even more formally done at his coronation some months from now, probably in spring of next year. Wow. When they put the crown on him. He's intending to have a miniature version of his mother's coronation. Now, she had 8,000 royals and dignitaries from all over the world at her coronation. He wants to have about a quarter of that. But still, every royal house in the world has been subservient to the British monarchy. And that's another topic, you know, their power base, which we can talk about. But they, uh, all the major royal houses of the world, even Japan's, report to the British monarchy through their orders of chivalry. Even Japan's emperor was a knight uh, under the British monarchy before World War II. He was kicked out during the war. He came right back in after the war. Akihito, his descendant, was then a knight in the, in the uh, Order of the Garter. That's the order of chivalry I'm speaking of in this case. That order is headed by birth by the British monarch of the day and the Prince of Wales of the day. So it was Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles. Now it's King Charles III and Prince William. But the point is, the Antichrist is known, folks. And if you haven't heard it, it's because your pastors, your preachers, your teachers, the ones you're listening to have not been paying enough attention. You know, the first edition of the Antichrist in the Cup of Tea was a bestseller. Hundreds of thousands of people at least have heard this information, what I'm sharing so far. Why haven't you heard about it? And I think part of the problem is, is in the past 20 years, uh, pastors are not even talking about Bible prophecy at all. So it's been, that's, that's just been a huge problem also. Well, yes. And the ones who are, again, they think it's almost like they're too arrogant. And I hate to say that. Mm -hmm. They think that they can look at this guy and say, well, what power does he have? That can't be the Antichrist. That's ridiculous. Well, you know, actually, Or that the church isn't going to go through these things. Therefore, oh, well, the church won't know who the Antichrist is in advance. We can know. That directly contradicts the scripture I've just cited, Revelation 13 and Daniel 7. The whole point of God telling us to calculate the number of the beast or giving us information like the first beast, for example, in Revelation 13, or the little horn of the eyes of man in Daniel 7, is so that we will know when the time comes. Anybody who says something other than that to you does not know what they're talking about. So don't listen to them until they do know what they're talking about. That's the first point I'll make. Till they, till they open their eyes, humble themselves, and are willing to look at the actual evidence that's given in the Antichrist and the cup of tea. So that being said, it's all laid out, but so much is under Prince Charles. He's behind everything happening in the world today. And you probably have never heard that. Right, right. Um, I found it interesting also because people talk about uh, Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset. But what, what did you find out about King Charles with the Great Reset? Yeah, when we hear about the Great Reset, the first thing people see typically is Klaus Schwab's book, you know, which is the Great Reset. And what the Great Reset, folks, is, is the actualization, the implementation on the ground of the new world order. In other words, the new world order was the plan and now they're implementing it. And that's what the great reset actually is. They're now actively fomenting it and bringing it to pass in a very plotted, planned, conspiratorial way. Now, Prince Charles was the person, not Klaus Schwab, who announced the great reset to the world from the World Economic Forum months before Klaus Schwab's book came out, months before Klaus Schwab mentioned the great reset, months before anybody else ever said anything about it, it was Prince Charles talking about the Great Reset and quote unquote, build back better. Interesting. Yeah, it was Prince Charles who personally kicked in motion and announced the world, the Great Reset. Klaus Schwab reports to Prince Charles, even though Klaus Schwab started the World Economic Forum, even though he is a socialist slash communist, uh, is over the World Economic Forum. He is under Prince Charles and the whole time has been. Wow. Wow. And all of us had no idea, um, but you did. I mean, cause you've been doing your research. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I find it also interesting that you said that Prince Charles, I'm saying Prince Charles, cause he was Prince at that time. Um, 
was behind the Middle East peace talks. Yeah, so when we talk about uh, global activities, this is one every Christian who pays any attention to prophecy knows. The Antichrist, you know, a prince of Roman lineage, they've probably heard the Roman lineage part, but if they haven't, they know the Antichrist, probably a prince, will be involved in a covenant, a treaty with Israel for seven years. Uh, Pre-tribulationists think, well, the church will be removed when that happens or right before it happens. Mid-tribulationists think the church will be removed at the midpoint of that seven-year period before the really bad stuff, the great tribulation happens, right? So they go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. That is the prophecy that speaks about this treaty or this covenant. But guess what? It doesn't say any of that. The only two things that are in that prophecy of what I've just shared are the word prince. Only in this case, it's he. It's in context from Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So the word prince and the word treaty or covenant. Other than those two words... Absolutely nothing that I just said about that treaty is in scripture. People have literally made that up. So what does it actually say? It says that this prince of Roman lineage will confirm or affirm, that's the way it's typically translated in English, and I'll come back to what the correct translation actually is, a treaty or a covenant, la rabim, the Hebrew is la rabim, with many, for one seven. And that seven in context is the seven years of the tribulation week. So that part, uh, people have gotten right. Those who talk about it, they, they understand that this thing is going to be confirmed or affirmed for a period of seven years. But there's nothing there about it being signed. There's nothing there about Israel being involved with it. It says it's with many, low rabim. The word Israel isn't there. There's nothing in that verse or prophecy about Israel at all. And then um, the word confirm or affirm is the Hebrew word gabor which means make strong or strengthen. By inference, what it really means is to impose or enforce. So this thing is not just affirmed or confirmed, it's externally imposed. It is enforced by this Prince of Roman lineage. So let's talk about what it really is. Number one, will Israel sign it? We don't know, scripture doesn't say. It's an argument from silence to say whether Israel will or will not sign it, number one. We just know that it's a treaty that's imposed or enforced with many under this Prince of Roman lineage, okay? Number two, the Great Reset involves most of the nations of the world. China's Xi Jinping is part of the World Economic Forum. Even him, communists, socialists, fascists, they're all part of the World Economic Forum under Prince Charles. Most of the Western uh, quote unquote democracies today report to Klaus Schwab and Prince Charles through the World Economic Forum. For example, more than half of Canada's entire cabinet is part of the World Economic Forum, including Justin Trudeau, reports to Prince Charles. South Africa's cabinet, New Zealand's cabinet, Australia's cabinet, the United States administration, all reporting to Prince Charles to the World Economic Forum, even Obama. You know, you can go right down the list, almost without exception, they've been infiltrated and co-opted by the World Economic Forum. And that's only one entity. Now, and I mentioned that in relation to Israel because of the covenant, but I'm gonna come back to Prince Charles specifically over the Mideast peace process because there is a process. So I'll circle back around directly to your question, but I wanna start with this prophecy where people get the notion that there's a treaty or a covenant in the first place, which is Daniel 9:27. So my point is, and I'm not saying we're in the tribulation week, I haven't determined that yet. I do think it's a strong possibility what will make the determination for me is if World War III starts this year involving North Korea and Iran, but specifically North Korea. And I'll come back to why that is. Uh, but if we see World War III start between now and January next year, we're already in the second year of the tribulation week, as you and I are talking right now. <laughs> if we do not see it happen, then that week has not yet started. I hope that the latter is the case, that we have a little more time. But this is how we're going to know. Okay, so without explaining how, why I'm saying that, just know that every single thing I say is firmly grounded in scripture and reality, objective truth, just like Prince Charles' coat of arms, it exists. So for example, the seven seals of the apocalypse summarize the seven years of the tribulation week. It's roughly a seal per year. That second seal deals with a fiery red horse that's tied to North Korea, and it's also oddly tied to Mobile Oil Corporation or Magnolia Oil originally, then Mobile, 
than ExxonMobil. It's the red Pegasus that they use for their symbol. How that all plays together, I'll explain a bit later if we if we get to that. But that's in my book called North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War, Behold a Red Horse. Wow. I even talked about the war with Russia and Ukraine. That's in the book. That book was published in 2018. <laughs> okay. I started that book in 2007, that time frame. That's when I began oh to write goodness. it. Oh, my goodness. So- yeah, that one took a while to get done. But... I am going, I'm going to have to read all of those. Wow, <laughs> Tim. So, so let's uh, let's talk about the well, peace now. talk. I just wanted yeah. to yeah talk about um, Prince Charles behind the London Agreement meetings. Yep, yep, and, yeah. But I was simply wanted to point out that if we're in the tribulation week already, people are going to say, "Well, where's the covenant? What is it?" Mm. My answer is going to be, "It's the Great Reset." Very and was already nice. announced by who? Prince Charles. And who's imposing it and enforcing it? Prince Charles is. If we're not in it, then there'll be something else like it that's yet to come. We'll see what's true. I don't yet know. Okay. So let's move on to the Mideast peace process. So the Mideast peace process has been under Prince Charles this entire time. Few people know that unless they've listened to me or read even the first edition of the Antichrist in a cup of tea. Why don't they know that? You know, you've got all these Christians out there, again, prophecy teachers, people looking at scripture. They know there's the Mideast peace process. Okay, why don't they know that it's Prince Charles who's over it? So let me explain. So in 1987, there was something called the London Agreement. That agreement was between Jordan's King Hussein, the one who's now deceased, he's been succeeded by his son, and Israel Shimon Perez, who also is deceased. The meetings that led to the London Agreement of 1987 were uh, organized by a Lord Victor Mishkan, who was a lawyer who worked for both Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. He organized the meeting at the prince's behest. That London Agreement uh, was the, the start of the Mideast peace process. It led to the, to the uh, Madrid peace talks. And of course, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, who was prime minister at that time, shelved it. It was later revived in the Oslo process. So we get we went from the London Agreement to the Madrid Peace Conference or Peace Talks. Uh, then all that being shelved by Yitzhak Shamir, it being revived subsequently on, under uh, Yitzhak Rabin when Shimon Peres then became uh, you know the second as it were under Yitzhak Rabin instead of Shamir. That led to the Oslo One Agreement, which was not a treaty, but an agreement on a set of principles to negotiate a treaty. Now, from the start, the Oslo process was organized into three agreements, divided initially as security talks and secondly as peace talks. So Oslo One led to uh, Oslo Two, which was an actual treaty. That was Oslo 1 and 2 were the security talks. So between Oslo 2 and 3, we got a treaty with Jordan, an actual treaty. None of that was the uh, peace treaty that was supposed to be between Israel and all her surrounding Arab adversaries, okay, her Muslim adversaries. That was supposed to be Oslo 3. But Oslo 3 never happened. It never came to fruition. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated not long after signing Oslo 2. So Shimon Perez is a knight of Prince Charles. He's one of his knights. Bill Gates, you know, everybody looks at the COVID-19 stuff. Bill Gates is a knight of the British monarchy. Yeah, there are a lot of instances like that that people don't realize where the people who are running the show, they're looking at these people saying, they seem to be, you know, really evil. Like in the case of Bill Gates, maybe he's the Antichrist. People have speculated, well, he's just a knight, you know, under Prince Charles, in this case, now King Charles III. So continuing, um, when Oslo III did not materialize, something called the Roadmap and the Quartet came along. The Quartet took over from the Oslo process and formed the Roadmap, which is their approach to try to get the so-called two-state solution, you know, to try to get a um, Palestinian state right there in the heart of Israel's promised land next to Israel. Two babies in the womb. Okay. So, yeah, one to kill the other, you know, under the Antichrist. Well, mm -hmm. the quartet from its inception was under Tony Blair. 
And for the majority of his existence, it was still under Tony Blair, though for a number of years now, it's been under somebody else. But Tony Blair uh, took that over right after he was prime minister of the UK. Now, that's when it came to fruition. And he reported, of course, to Prince Charles. Mm. And the people who have been in charge of the quartet since Tony Blair report to Prince Charles. They're his subjects. So the whole time he's been over it. Well, what is the quartet? The quartet is the United States, the European Union, Russia, and the United Nations. And because the United Nations is in the quartet, it's all the nations of the world. Oh, wow. Yeah. Under Prince Charles. Now, pushing this agenda to divide the promised land and, and make Israel's borders even more indefensible than they already are. Which, again, we didn't know that he was behind all of this. And you even show from the start with the um, London. I mean, that's that's amazing. But again, this is stuff that we would know unless we're going to read all your books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is the, this is all in the second edition of the Antichrist and Captivity, but also um, up to the point of the Oslo process, that's in the first edition, the, court, the uh, quartet, the red map, that was all after the first edition of my book came out. Apart from all that, Prince Charles is over everything else happening in the world, not just through the Great Reset. Uh, he did make an official visit to Israel. I was there was ask a you. Holocaust Memorial, you know, the annual Holocaust Memorial. Well, they had one not too long ago where they had global leaders come and speak about the Shoah and so forth. They had, uh, Putin for Russia speak. Uh, Pence was there for the United States. Um, Germany's uh, prime minister was there, et cetera. They all spoke. And guess who spoke for the United Kingdom? Prince Charles. He gave an absolutely fantastic speech. And so did Putin. Those two individuals gave the best speeches out of all the world leaders who spoke. Prince Charles really ingratiated himself to Israel with that. You know, and all these world leaders participated in a group photo right afterward, except for Prince Charles. He skipped out. Instead, he went to meet with the Palestinians to push the division of the land. Oh, wow. So right there, he's, he's seeming to bless Israel and giving a fantastic speech against anti-Israelism or so-called anti-Semitism. And the next thing he's doing is meeting with Israel's worst, most implacable enemies to see how can we push this so-called peace process forward. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so that's the Mideast peace process. And all this talk of trying to revive it and so forth, whether that happens or not, we may have already seen the Treaty of Daniel 927, or it's just possible there'll be something else to come if we're not in the tribulation week yet that maybe Israel will sign. Maybe they won't. Maybe Israel's adversaries will sign. Maybe they won't. But let me also point out on imposition, it's impossible to have a treaty between Israel and her adversaries. It can't happen. Here's why. Right now, it can't happen. Because Israel has uh, vociferously refused to divide Jerusalem all this time, specifically to give up the Temple Mount area. They're willing to fudge things, to play games, to do 1984 newspeak type stuff. <laughs> you don't say, oh, the modern additions to Jerusalem, you know, that stuff built out around the old city of Jerusalem. You can call that Jerusalem if you want, and you can have that as your capital if we happen to come to a two-state solution. But you're not touching the Temple Mount area. That's ours. That's the old city. We're not going to divide east from west in that context. They're saying the whole city is ours. It's going to stay ours forever. That's what Israel's saying. Palestinians are saying, if you don't give it to us, we're going to continue to make war till we push you into the sea and you are no more. Mm -hmm. right? right? How is there going to be agreement? over that. There can't be, unless it's just lie upon lie upon lie from both sides. Right. It and, it's can't such a, be. and it's such a small sliver of land that it would be easy for them to push them into the sea. Yes. And while Ehud, Ehud Olmert, who'd been prime minister of Israel for a while, uh, for example, was almost willing to divide Jerusalem. Uh, while he was perhaps next to, I'll say, um, one other individual who had a stroke and died right after he ceded Gaza, never came out of his coma. Next to him, Ehud, Ehud Olmert and perhaps Yitzhak Rabin were the, were the most traitorous prime ministers Israel's ever had. And Ehud Olmert came the closest to being willing to divide Jerusalem. Nobody has come close like that since. 
not even Israel's worst politicians. So here's what happens instead. The world says, we're tired of this nonsense and of you all not being able to get along. You're threatening the stability of the Middle East. And in doing that, you're threatening our lives with something that could potentially be a flashpoint for World War III. And so the world under Prince Charles, now King Charles III, is going to say, we've had enough. We've offered to provide troops through NATO or the United Nations, you know, like a border force, kind of like between Lebanon and Israel. And, and we get that that has totally failed to do what we said it would do, right? That UNIFIL force has never, never once done what it promised to Israel in keeping that area demilitarized and not allowing Hezbollah to build up all these missiles and yada, yada against Israel, et cetera, right? So of course, Israel's not going to trust anything out of the UN for that and a myriad of other reasons, let alone from NATO. But NATO is the next most trustworthy option, and especially the United States. And the Obama-Biden administration, now the Biden-Obama administration, and even the Trump administration all offered NATO troops to Israel as an alternative to enforce Israel's peace and security if Israel were to cede you know, enough territory and perhaps East Jerusalem to allow Palestinian state. Well, I don't think that's going to happen, but instead what's most likely to happen is Israel will be attacked successfully by our enemies after World War III. So this will be a, a movement in or on the end of World War III, let's put it that way, okay? So right after World War III, Israel will be successfully attacked, Jerusalem encircled by the militaries of the nations. Global nuclear warfare will be right there on the edge. Israel will be ready to annihilate dozens of nations around it, literally kill them all, you know, in a Samson type option. And instead of doing that, the world is going to say no, no further, you know, than the 1967 lines or something like that to Israel's adversaries. You can take half of Jerusalem. You do not touch anything further. Palestinians, that's not what they want. They want it all. Mm -hmm. They want to drive Israel into the sea. And if now, the world under this counterfeit savior, the Antichrist, is guaranteeing Israel's security, you know, at the, at the point of the 1967 borders or the like, they can't continue with their plot to annihilate Israel. So what will they do? They'll rape the women, rifle the houses, carry the captives away as far as Babylon in Iraq in a new Babylonian captivity. You know, Saddam Hussein was rebuilding Babylon historically. So we can call it a new Babylonian captivity. That's the portion that they're allowed to take into captivity up to East Jerusalem, that area where the Temple Mount is. And when they've taken the Temple Mount, that's when the abomination that causes desolation is erected, et cetera. And by the way, that statue is to Prince Charles and it already exists. Yeah, it came out I, I after wanted you to talk about, about that statue because yeah. it's very interesting. So we talked about the coat of arms. We talked a little bit about the lineage. And let me just say on the lineage, Prince Charles descends from virtually every royal house in the history of the world mm. post-flood. He also descends from the ancient Roman emperors, the ancient Assyrian kings, the ancient Babylonian kings, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Hmm. There's almost not a lineage of any, there is no lineage of any significance that any Christian would ever point to from which he does not descend. And by the way, there was a crusader title called King of Jerusalem. The crusaders, when they captured Jerusalem from the Muslims, the crusader who was in charge of Jerusalem was titled King of Jerusalem. That's the Habsburg lineage today, the Habsburg dynasty. Prince Charles descends from that. And guess who the title belongs to today, if not the Habsburgs? If they were to give it to anybody else, it's actually to Prince Charles. <laughs> he's of that lineage. And when he's in control of this territory in Jerusalem and so forth in the not too distant future, he is king of Jerusalem per that title, that crusader title. So th with that being said, uh, in the early 2000s, years after the first edition of the Antichrist and the was published, Prince Charles was hailed savior of the world, environmental savior of the world. So I mentioned uh, earlier that all these agendas, for example, to collapse our oil and gas, and I'll mention coal also industries globally, are under Prince Charles. That agenda to do that for the West is under Prince Charles. So everybody thinks of Al Gore, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people think of Al Gore when we talk about the environmental movement, right? The reality is that it's not Al Gore. You know, it's the British monarchy 
that is responsible for the modern environmental movement, almost in its totality. Starting with the British Fauna and Flora, Prote Fauna and Flora Protection Society of the 1800s, which in turn led to the World Resources Institute, and not in this particular order, but the World Resources Institute, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the World Wildlife Fund, which has branches in multiple nations now, starting in the UK. All of that was under the British monarchy and then under Prince Philip. And then from 1969 on, Prince Charles got heavily involved with it and basically took it over. And when we get to the Rio Earth Summit of the early 1990s, held in Rio de Janeiro, that was the first major summit in history related to greenhouse gases. The Rio Earth Summit convened the major stakeholders in terms of the industrialized world. And the meetings were held aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia before they were held anywhere else, convened, overseen by Prince Charles. Hmm. He is the reason the Rio Earth Summit, quote unquote, succeeded according to Al Gore and according to the president of Brazil at the time. He was credited personally by world leadership for the success of the Rio Earth Summit, not Al Gore, Prince Charles. And because of that, the president of Brazil, uh, one of the states in Brazil, Tocantins, commissioned a statue to Prince Charles. And you said that was to, in the early 2000s, correct? Yes. To hail him as the environmental savior of the world. Now, this is uh, really critical. And by the way, this wasn't in the first edition of the book, because again, this is years after that book was published. Right. It's in the second edition. So folks should be able to see the statue in the second edition and a whole lot more related to it. But the statue actually has the phrase savior of the world inscribed on its base. And it shows Prince Charles standing atop a mass of human bodies, one looking, uh, excuse me, one drinking a uh, bottle of wine and all of them looking up to him as the kind of savior figure. But I mean, his, his feet are standing atop their heads. Oh. Okay. On this statue. And the statue is naked and dressed only in a loincloth, just a loincloth. And it has Prince Charles head. And here's the thing. It has, outspreading wings like he's an angelic figure mm. okay so they're depicting prince charles as an in an angelic sense dressed only in a loincloth as savior of the world okay environmental savior of the world so they think they're going to save the world by doing this stuff in relation to the environment cop 21 which was held in paris france had the largest gathering of global leadership at one place at one time in the whole history of the world ever, you know, that we know of since the flood, ever, maybe ever period. They had 150 plus heads of state at that event, 190 plus world leaders. And when I say heads of state, I mean presidents, prime ministers, the very top people of those nations. You would think that since France hosted it, that it would have been France's president who would have opened the event, maybe given the first speech, or if not him, than someone like Al Gore, since, well, right, everybody talks about Al Gore. But who was it? No, yeah. it was Prince Charles. He opened the whole event. He gave the first speech before all of those world leaders. COP26, who was it? That was held in England. Well, the United Kingdom, I should say. It was Prince Charles, opened it, gave the first speech, same, same thing all over again. So now this is all being driven through the World Economic Forum and other entities in a more formal, direct way. Now, I want to go back to that statue, mm -hmm. though. Um, mm -hmm. when, he, when Prince Charles saw the statue, what did he say? Because that's a smaller version. Yeah, there were two versions of the statue that were commissioned. A miniature version, which the BBC photographed. So those photos will be shown in the book. The same thing as the large version, uh, except that the large version, uh, potentially, and I point this out in the second edition of the book, is 10 cubits in height. Why is that significant? because the two angelic statues that went on either side of the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place in Israel's ancient temples were each 10 cubits in height. Again, this is an angelic statue. What is the intention for it? They're gonna put it on the Temple Mount in the future, in the Holy of Holies, a newly constructed Holy of Holies. And that's it, folks. The abomination that causes desolation, it's not just that the first beast has existed all this time, identifying the Antichrist in the name calculation. The statue has existed. The idol has existed since the early 2000s. 
Yeah. And Prince Charles, when he was presented the miniature version, instead of saying, no, don't call me savior of the world. That's offensive. I worship the God of Israel, or I'm a Christian, or I worship the God of heaven or anything like that. He said, I'm honored and deeply amazed. <laughs> right. Oh, gee, thank you. You know, you're so right to give me that. You're finally getting the picture here, guys. Uh, thank you. That yeah. That's just great. Well, I you know, find it, yeah, <laughs> I, I find it also interesting uh, when I was like looking, um, reading your information, um, you were also talking about how Queen Elizabeth called Prince Charles the chosen one and no one ever really knew why. Yes, from um, his birth, from his birth. Yeah, that's very interesting to me. And then it's interesting to me because Israel becoming a nation in 1948 is a big key to Bible prophecy. And then he, he was born six months later. To the um, day, to the day. Yep. Oh, interesting. Now, May 14th versus November 14th, 1948. Wow. Now, um, does the UN uh, have anything to do like with the 10... Uh, rulers or right now has what five permanent does that have anything to do with bible prophecy i want to say something else about the statue joey and, and you're the this is the first program i'm ever going to mention this on i'm going to let you and your audience be the first to ever hear this you know publicly i've shared it with a couple of pastors i've shared it with bonnie judah recently nobody else has ever heard this so um but they will it's in the <laughs> book and uh it's a big deal so you recall when Israel's ancient temple was defiled by Antiochus IV, and that name is pronounced different ways, but he was the Greek king who sacrificed a pig on the altar and murdered the Israelis who wouldn't participate naked in the Greek games in Jerusalem, who desecrated the temple. And for that reason, the temple needed to be cleansed. And thus we got Hanukkah, the miracle of Hanukkah, right? That was in the second century BC. It was that guy who did that, okay? So the ancient Greek and also the ancient Roman uh, emperors worshipped um, Zeus and Jupiter, respectively, right? The way that they would portray Zeus and Jupiter, most commonly, was either completely naked with outspread wings or dressed only in a loincloth with outspread rings. Whoa. That statue to Prince Charles is basically hailing him as Zeus or Jupiter. That is what it is. But even more than that, the statue is described in granular detail in the root words of Daniel 9.27 for the abomination that causes desolation. Most people can read that translation in a typical English translation and realize that wings are associated in some fashion with that idol. But the root words of the Hebrew tell us much more. In the root words of the Hebrew, it actually describes a statue not just with overspreading wings, but dressed only in a loincloth and associated with the name Charles. Why the name Charles? Because it's associated with, with uh, strong or making strong, with, with the idea of strengthening. Okay, that same word Gabor, to make strong, the meaning of the word Charles in English is to make strong oh. or to strengthen or like strong man. Oh my goodness. Okay? Yeah. So that the root words, are describing specifically the statue to Charles, who is being portrayed as Zeus or Jupiter by that statue. What could there be more appropriate to the devil to stick on the Temple Mount than that? Uh, this is amazing information, Tim. It really is. I mean, your research is unbelievable. Um, now, what were you gonna say as far as the UN? Yes. So Christians have looked at how this antichrist will come to power. A lot of people have said, you know, like Joel Rosenberg, a guy I handed my book to years and years ago. I don't think he's ever read it because since then he's continued to push the idea that Turkey's president could be the Antichrist and that the Antichrist will come out of the Middle East, you know, Confederation of Ten Nations in the Middle East or something like that. Not what scripture says. And I'm going to come back to what scripture says. That's as different from what scripture says as to uh, say, well, the Pope is the Antichrist because Vicar can be made to calculate to 666. You know, that's to ignore, in fact, what scripture actually says. There are others who look at the European community or before that, the European economic community and say, well, we think the Antichrist is going to come out of the EU or the EEC or just that. 
Others look at the Treaty of Rome and say, well, they were talking about 10 regions. Okay, that's a little bit more reasonable to look at that. So what does fit scripture? And I gave the scenario in the first edition of the Antichrist to Kepti. And let me tell you folks, not one thing in that book has needed to be changed to this day, except now the title for Prince Charles as King Charles III. Okay, and a few people have died. That's all. The evidence has only strengthened and progressed since the book was published. And that's what you would expect if it's the real information for the real Antichrist, okay? The scenario I gave for the 10 kings and the rise to power, and the 10 kings, by the way, come out of Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, okay? Initially, Daniel chapter 7. So this little horn of the eyes of man comes in among 10 kings or 10 rulers. He uproots three of the 10. So he effectively becomes the eighth among seven. And again, that's a unicorn with human eyes. And by the way, I didn't mention this, Johnny, but one of the, um, the actually the major code name for Prince Charles among our secret service when he would visit the United States is unicorn. And he personally, Charles, referred to the unicorn on his coat of arms as my little horn. He knows what the deal is. He had a patch when he flew helicopters as the commander of a minesweeper in the Royal, uh, in the RAF and, and in the Navy, the Royal Navy, he had a patch that he wore on his shoulder all the time that was the Red Dragon of Wales. His call sign was Red Dragon. Prince Charles was. Interesting. Okay. So those symbols directly associated with him in, in more ways than just his coat of arms, his heroic achievement. At any rate, the 10 kings. So that's part of the scenario. You've got to have three of the 10 that are uprooted. Now, Christians think the three go away. That's usually how people interpret it. Three are just gone, killed, something like that, maybe. Okay. That's incorrect. The way we know that's incorrect is that those 10, you know, he comes in among them at the start of the Great Tribulation. That's how the global governance, the global government is formed under him. And that government, that rule is three and a half years long for Daniel 7 and Revelation 11 and Revelation 13. Those three chapters tell us that that rule is 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years in length, okay? But at the end of the tribulation week, at the end of that great tribulation, in Revelation 17, you know, that hour in which mystery Babylon gets burned and destroyed, and that's in conjunction with the time frame of Armageddon, pardon me, at the very end, there are still 10 kings under the Antichrist. So how is it that three are uprooted three and a half years earlier, but at the end, there are still 10? The answer is that those three become his vassals. They don't go away. They are under his direct authority. You know, these 10 are ceding their power initially to this beast, this antichrist. They're volunteering it. They're giving it to him to form this global government. In that process, he uproots three of the 10. They come under his direct authority. It's no longer just voluntary. Okay, but there's another component to this imagery, which is what actually makes it so that it can't be just the European Union or the EEC. And that is these 10 kings are also portrayed as 10 toes on a statue earlier in the book of Daniel. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar's vision. You know, the gold head in the vision was Babylonia, in this case, Babylon. And it represented a progression of global empires down to the toes in history from the time of Babylonia to our present day. So those 10 toes are five each on two feet attached to two legs that go up to the core of that statue, right? So a, a human appearing statue as it were, or humanoid, whatever, with a gold head. The two legs are historically understood by theologians as the East-West division in the Roman empire. Interesting. So you get five from the East, five from the West. That's the key thing that people have missed when they try to look at the European Union or the EC or the Treaty of Rome, or for that matter, just the Middle East. You can't fit the East-West division on any of those scenarios. You can't make that work, no matter how hard you try. And there aren't 10 nations in the European Union or the EC. There never were, you know, never was that kind of scenario. And there aren't in the Middle East, by the way, either. And there's never going to be before this is all said and done. So that being said, my scenario was an expansion of the United Nations Security Council to 10 permanent members. 
And since before I even knew about Prince Charles, they were talking about reforming the UN Security Council to 10 permanent members. And how many did they have at that time? They've had five the whole time until this day. You know, there, there are other members that rotate on and off the council on a regular basis, but they're not permanent and they don't have veto rights. The permanent members are always on the council since the creation of the United Nations, and they can veto any resolution. So uh, there are also 10 seats in the United Nations meditation room. There have always been 10 seats. Why? And all this time since the 1980s and maybe earlier, but certainly since before the first edition of the Antichrist and the Capiti was published in 1998, the UN has come out every year or two or three and said, you know, we're still looking at reform here to make us more representative of the global population. And usually they suggest an expansion to 10 permanent members. Sometimes they'll, they'll have other suggestions in there, but almost invariably, well, invariably, they do come back to 10 permanent members. That suggestion always comes back up again. So my suggestion is that what they'll do is someday they'll expand it to 10 permanent members and we'll see five from the East and five from the West as we think of the East-West division in the world today. And I'm gonna show how the UN came out of the Roman empire out of those two legs here in a moment. But key to that also is three of the 10 will be from the European Union. So on the current five, you've got France and England along with Russia, China, and the United States. Okay, those are the current five. But France and England, they're there. They've already decided who two of the new five will be. And that's Germany and Japan, they're shoe-ins at this point for the new five. Because Germany will be there, three of the 10 will be from the European Union or the EEC, the Fourth Reich. Now the British monarchy is the monarchy historically of Germany, France, and England, as well as Greece. You know, I mentioned that Prince Charles descends from all these royal houses in the world and so forth, but the nearest lineages are Germany, France, and England, and Greece. They are the monarchy of Europe. So the scenario that I gave uh, in the Antichrist Kepti, the first edition, published in 1998, was one day we'll wake up and see the Security Council expanded to 10 permanent members. And then maybe the next day they'll say, oh, by the way, uh, we've decided here in the European Union that we're going to make the British monarchy our monarchy. And guess what? Prince Charles is in charge of three of 10 overnight. Did anybody see that coming? No. Was there any fanfare? No. But before Brexit, the diplomatic missions of Germany, France, and England were united as well. That's another way. You know, even if they don't announce the British monarchy as their monarchy, there are other ways the three of the 10 could come under his direct authority. Okay. So that being said, uh, the United Nations came out of the League of Nations, historically. The League of Nations largely came out of the Royal Institute of International Affairs post-World War II. The Royal, Inter the Royal Institute of International Affairs, or excuse me, post-World War I. So you get World War I, then the uh, League of Nations, then the United Nations. But the League of Nations came out of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Prince Charles has for decades headed the Royal Institute of International Affairs, also known as Chatham House in London. The United Nations owes its existence to Chatham House, to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, because the League of Nations did. Prince Charles heads it. He has all this time. Now King Charles III heads it. So, uh, and obviously they're a Roman monarchy also. You know, this all comes out of the ancient Roman empire. So that being presented, the United, there's more to it than this. I documented in the first issue of the Antichrist of Capiti that Prince Charles called for a standing United Nations army. Okay, I, I documented that even in the first issue of the Antichrist of Capiti with himself as the commander of that army. Mm -hmm. That's what he wanted. The United Nations has a global security lecture series. Prince Charles personally initiated it. Prince Charles gave the first global security lecture at the United Nations in New York in person. Okay, Tim, explain in the, there's a scripture you said in Genesis, I read in your materials about the tribe of Dan and how that would relate to Prince Charles. Okay, 
I'll tell you about that and something that I didn't mention in this interview that just happened with regard to Prince Charles before he became king, before his mother died. So uh, in Genesis, Jacob was blessing his children. And the statements that he made were, among other things, prophecies concerning their line that would come after them. Of the tribe of Dan, he said, Dan is a serpent, by the way, who strikes the horse's heels so that its rider goes backward. I have, or falls backward, I have waited for your salvation, Lord. That's what Jacob said to Dan. Okay. So the word translated as serpent there is the same as the word used in Genesis 3 for the devil, which translates also as red dragon. That is something we know factually from Revelation 12, where that serpent is referred to as the red dragon and as Satan, right? Directly, explicitly. So Dan is a red dragon, by the way, who strikes the horse's heel. Now we know of Genesis 3 verse 15, that there would be conflict between two seeds, conflict between the woman's seed, meaning Eve's seed, and the serpent's seed, meaning the red dragons or the devil's seed, right? So that the devil's seed would strike the woman's seed's heels, right? His heel. That's what it's typically translated as, but the meaning of the Hebrew actually is his protuberant, the things that stick out from the body. So it could compass the hands, the feet, and the head. All the places Christ was crucified and when the cor where the coronet was placed on his head. So the serpent would strike, or his seed would strike the woman's seed's heel, or his protuberance, the crucifixion. And in turn, the woman's seed would crush the head of the serpent's seed, right? Okay. So now we come to this prophecy on Dan. Dan is a red dragon, by the way. He strikes the horse's heels so that its rider goes backward. I have waited for your salvation, Lord, right? The word salvation there is Yeshua. I have waited for your shoot, your Yeshua, Lord. So Dan is a serpent who strikes the horse's heel. The rider goes backward. I've waited for your Yeshua, Lord, right? So there are two versions of Prince Charles' achievement shown in all editions of the Antichrist and Captivity. So the first edition also, the official and the unofficial. On the official one, the unicorn is bound. And that there's a chain that's called a restrainer in Heraldry. That's actually what it's called. The chain restrains the unicorn by being bound to the compartment below it. And below that unicorn is the red dragon of Wales in the compartment, not touching it. So on the official version, the red dragon is in that compartment, not touching it. It's encircled by a gold compartment. Above that compartment resting on it are the hooves of that unicorn, which is not rearing back and it's chained to the base of that compartment. That's the official arms. The little horn of the eyes of man, is restrained, and the red dragon is not touching the compartment below it, okay? The unofficial version is really interesting because the red dragon suddenly touches the compartment, the unicorn rears back. Just like, it, just like that prophecy in Genesis. The chain is loosed. The restrainer is loosed. Second Thessalonians 2, when the Antichrist is revealed. The unicorn takes on a, instead of a smooth, almost pleasant demeanor, like the unicorn on the official arms, it takes on a very demonic, deathly look. The unicorn does as it rears back, okay? All those beasts on Prince Charles' arms form a corporate beast, and it's got its own helm called the, the sovereign helm, which is the corporate helm, the corporate, the helm, the corporate head of the overall heraldic achievement, a combination of those beasts as though it were a single entity in in uh, the occultism of heraldry, okay? So each of those beasts also individually represents Prince Charles himself directly. And I explain how that is from the symbolism, the emblems used in the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. All editions explain that. So when this unicorn goes back, it's like Prince Charles going back, but it's also signifying the devil has possessed him. So this pertains to the midpoint of the tribulation week. This is portraying the future, in other words. These beasts and heraldry are not just to identify a combatant, it's to tell their future mm. when they're very occult like this, okay? So from the beginning, they knew that he would be king, which is why they put the sovereign helm 
on his coat of arms as Prince of Wales. It's very unusual. Even his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, when she was princess, had her own coat of arms that did not have the sovereign helm. That was added when they knew that she was going to be queen, okay, to give us the coat of arms that everyone has seen associated with the United Kingdom and with Queen Elizabeth II until now, okay? Prince Charles, now King Charles III, had that helm on his heraldic achievement from the beginning. So that they was their intent. He that was was their intent. Yeah. They always knew it, right? And the same thing on that unofficial version where he's rearing back, they always knew at some point he was going to be possessed by the devil and the chain was going to be loosed, okay? This ties into the prophecy about Dan. You see, the British monarchy claims to be descended from King David, as I pointed out. In reality, they're actually descended from the tribe of Dan. And because of that, through uh, Tiatefi or Tefatefania, on that lineage of the queens, they claim that the prophet Jeremiah made his way to the British Isles with some Israelites, Danites, and that one of them is in the lineage of the British monarchy. So they're Danites, okay? And why that's significant that they actually are Danites, two reasons. One is it was the tribe of Dan that led ancient Israel into idolatry, which resulted in the schism between Judea and Israel, the civil war that divided the kingdom so that we got Judea and Israel. That's all because of the tribe of Dan. And as a result of that, when we get to the 144,000 in the New Testament in Revelation, the tribe of Dan was completely excluded from Amazing. the 144,000. Wow. And the tribe of Joseph got a double portion between Manasseh and Ephraim, his two sons. They got 24,000, Joseph did, but 12,000 between each of those two sons to substitute for the absence of the tribe of Dan. Now, Christians looked at this and before Christianity, Israel's sages looked at this and they said, the Antichrist, the black one is what they called him rather than the Prince of Darkness would come from the tribe of Dan because of that prophecy in Genesis. So they knew there was a war between Yeshua, salvation, and the devil, the red dragon, portrayed around Dan from that prophecy. And it is actually depicted, portrayed on Prince Charles' coats of arms. Now King Charles III's coats of arms. Yeah, that's unbelievably incredible information. There's just too much that's in the scriptures that that's proving who he is. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so here's the thing I didn't share earlier that happened this year. And you'll want this. This is a big deal. This is a very big deal that this just happened right before he became king. So folks, pay close attention. You're going to want to go look this up. And I give the full details completely documented in the second edition of the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. Here it is, July 28th at the Commonwealth Games, the 22nd Commonwealth Games for 2022. You have these every few years. They've been going on the whole time. The Queen Elizabeth II was queen. It's the largest set of international games in the world after the Olympics. And this year they had uh, 72 nations and territories participating. Roughly, they estimate almost a third of the world's population potentially watching, okay? The whole British Commonwealth. Uh, at this event, Prince Charles opened it in lieu of the queen on her behalf. He oversaw the whole thing. He was there in person at the Alexander Stadium in Birmingham, Birmingham, England, okay? At that event, a giant Molech bull, 10 meters in height, was rolled out into the center of the stadium to be worshiped and to face a large recreated, rebuilt right there in front of everybody, mock Tower of Babel with shards in it. And it begins with a star exploding in our solar system. That's how they introduced this. A lot of CGI initially, they portray a star outside our solar system or maybe deep in our solar system blowing up past Saturn. And it explodes a bright star like Lucifer. That's what it is, exploding. And its shards fly through our solar system and they reach earth and they land in all the nations of the Commonwealth. And these 72 quote unquote dreamers, new agers, find these shards outside their homes. They retrieve them. The first person to do so is named Stella. She picks it up, it's lit, it's brightly lit. It's like a large quartz crystal that's bright white, lit as bright white, like, a, like a, an interior light as it were, 
bright white. She picks this thing up and she prays to it, whispers to it and prays to it. Then she takes us back to her home. All these others, these 72 dreamers, there's 72 of them total, including her, pick their shards up and they take them to their homes. As soon as they do, there are anti-gravity effects in their homes. Things start to float in the air. And then their homes are lifted up off the ground with these people in them. And they float across the Commonwealth from other nations and across the UK, across seas and oceans and lakes and forests and so forth to Birmingham, England, to be over the stadium. All these homes floating over the stadium and then they land and the dreamers exit them in front of the audience and they have the shards in hand. The bull then comes onto the stadium pulled by slave women, slavish women on chains. The bull, they portray this rebels and detaches from the chains. And these female slaves who've been driven like by somebody who's kind of like a Roman, you know, a demon, whatever, because he didn't quite look like a Roman, are freed, right? So now the bull and these women are freed and they pretend they're afraid of each other. And the bull goes on to the center of the stadium and these quote unquote dreamers, these new agers encircle the thing. But initially before they do that, Stella comes with her crystal. She and five others, there are six of them, six of the dreamers, apart from these slavish women, who are behind now on the bull to other si either side of it as it's moving, kind of charging actually into the center of the stadium, okay, from the, from, the ex from the track from just outside where it's entered, you know, now detached from its chain, no longer restrained, okay? Charges into the center of the stadium, Stella wanting to appease this thing so that they're not killed by this Molech idol, goes with this new age crystal, approaches it slowly with these five other dreamers. She's got the crystal in her left hand, and then she puts her hand up to the nose of the bowl, and it bows down so that she can touch its nose with a crystal in her hand. She's the only one holding her crystal at that point. And the bull is, at least at that moment, appeased. And there's a whole backstory to this, and they say things, they announce things to the audience, you know, about peace, love, friendship, yada, yada, you know, conflict resolves slaves freed, all this kind of stuff. And as this is happening, the, uh, the slavish, and there are multiple stages to this, so I'm gonna be skipping over some things, but this bull kind of calms down. It's facing the Tower of Babel this whole time. And at times there are flames like the towers, like the flames of hell all over this Tower of Babel, okay? You know, and it's facing this thing, the bull is. They encircle it multiple times and they literally worship it. They've all got their crystals in hand. They bow down to this thing. And then later Stella gets atop it and rides it as the woman riding the beast. And there are then 71 dreamers encircling it. And they're bowing down to this thing, worshiping it and literally doing a new age worship ceremony with their crystals before this thing and inviting the whole Commonwealth to join them in this worship. And who's overseeing all of this? Prince Charles. And then the woman's riding the beast, right? And as we get toward the end of the ceremony, and there are a bunch of songs, by the way, that are accommodating this with, with significant lyrics, okay? And I won't go into that, but it's all documented in the book. At the end, okay, as it's getting book, dark. Which book, which book is this? This, will be in the, this is going to be in the second edition of the Antichrist of Tea. One reason it's a little bit delayed is I have to get this in there. It's too critical, okay? Right there at the end, the bull is rearing back so it's rising up on its front feet, okay? And it's encircled by the flags of all these nations, the 72. They've literally placed their flags at the base of this thing. So they're not just worshiping it with their crystals and all the rest, and not just being ridden by Stella, you know, the woman riding the beast. Now the tower is rising again before this beast. It's been built. And all the nations, by the way, their names have gone across this tower already at this point, been displayed on its surface. At the top of this tower, I told you those shards came down earlier from the heavens this blown up Luciferian star representing the devil, reaching the earth, falling to the earth, the devil falling to the earth, okay? And being taken up by these new agers. So they all approach, they, they leave the bull now, but the flags are at the base of the bull, showing the nations are all worshiping around this bull, the 71. And I'm gonna come back to the number 71, it's extremely significant. But at any rate, they all come to the base of this tower with their shards in hand, and they stick them into the side of the tower. And they ascend 
visibly through the tower. And as they get toward the top of the tower, they form this ball, the original star that blew up, reconstituted, and then it rises above the tower and you get this huge disco-like ball atop the tower that's lit up very brightly and a beam of light goes between that ball and the chest of the ball. Now it's nighttime at this point in Alexander Stadium, an open air stadium. So you can see these lights, but they're portraying the rebuilding of the Tower of Babel in our day with Lucifer wow. being over it, being worshiped by all the nations of the world. And why do I say all? I said that the 72 dreamers were for the 72, they're for the 72 nations and territories of the British Commonwealth, right? Stella being the 72nd, she's riding the bull. Why 71 worshiping around the bull? Okay, how does that represent all the nations? Well, here's the deal. At the, tower, at the Feast of Tabernacles every year, Israel would sacrifice 70 bulls, not 71, 70. And Israel's rabbis historically understood that to represent the nations that came out of the scattering from the Tower of Babel. So they took those 70 to represent the nations of the world. And the way Christians and often the rabbinic community have interpreted those 70 bulls that were sacrificed, they would say, well, we have our God and we worship him and we do sacrifices on behalf of Israel. This is how it would be interpreted, right? So these 70 are for the nations. And oftentimes Christians look at that and they think this is a sacrifice on behalf of the nations. So that maybe their sins would be forgiven. The ones who don't worship the God of Israel at the Feast of Tabernacles each year, it was never that. That is not what it ever in history represented. So I'm going to come back to what it did represent in a moment. It did represent the 70 nations. That's correct. But the reason there were 71 around the base of this bowl is because Israel was included. You see, the nation of Israel came after the 70 at the Tower of Babel, right? Interesting. So now they're saying, oh, Israel, by the way, you're not going to worship your God anymore. You're going to worship Lucifer with us. Mm. So there are 71 instead of 70 at the base of this bowl, led by the woman riding the beast, representing, if you want, the harlot church under the Antichrist, okay? Well, what were the sacrifices really about? at tabernacles, the 70 bulls? Was it for the sins of the nations? I'm going to tell you, no. It was their death and destruction. their crushing by the Messiah at Armageddon. That's what it really represented. When God, our God, sacrifices the nations like brute beasts, man without understanding is like the beasts that perish. That is what scripture tells us multiple times. Those nations that did not worship God that were at the base of the Tower of Babel historically were not worshipers of the real God. They were engaging in paganism and God scattered them to the nations. He brought a nation separate from them, a new nation, Israel, the 71, the 71st. Okay. So we can look in Revelation 19, in Ezekiel 39, we can see that when the Lord is done with Armageddon, that the birds of prey come down to eat the flesh of the slain, like beasts, right? The flesh of slain, like, like man without understanding. Sacrifice like beasts. How do we know that the world is like beasts in that context to God? In Acts chapter 10 through 15 and chapter 10, Peter was shown a scroll. It was, it was atop a, a house, a rooftop. A scroll rolled down from the heavens before him. And in it were beasts of all kinds, creatures, crawly things, right? right. Different kinds of life. And three times God said to Peter, arise, slay and eat. And three times Peter refused. He rebuked God. He said, not so, Lord. Now, almost in an angry tone. Not so, Lord. Nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth or passed my lips, right? And the third time, and each time God said to Peter, what God calls clean, uh, do not call, what God, I forget the exact wording, but what God sanctifies basically don't call common or unclean. That's essentially what he says to Peter each time. And at that moment, the scroll disappears. But the whole point is these nations that Peter saw were represented as unclean beasts. And most of the nations of the world, many of them, even to this day, have unclean animals, what would biblically be considered unclean to eat, as their symbols. Oh, interesting. So when these bulls were sacrificed you know, on behalf of the nations, in this case, they were symbolizing the Molech worshipers being killed by Christ at Armageddon, okay? Man without understanding, sacrifice like the beast, you know, you know, like beasts. And that's what we have. We have an attempt 
under Prince Charles, now King Charles III, to flip all that on its head and to get modern mankind to worship the devil with this ancient Molech imagery, to invite mankind to do that and to suggest that Israel is going to be a part of it. That was July 28th this year at the opening of the Commonwealth Games. So for that to happen, and then Charles to become King Charles, right after that, King Charles III. Wow, the timing. It's incredibly significant. Ah, uh, uh, Yeah, the timing is amazing. Oh, and I'm going to wrap it up with one other point, which makes all of this that's very significant even more so. You know, if you could imagine that. So, and I pointed this out, by the way, in the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, it's also been in drafts of my Messiah history in the tribulation period since the 1980s, some of which I circulated about 30 copies to earlier viewers in the early 1990s, okay? Before, uh, a long time before the Antichrist and Cup of Tea was published. So I'm not just saying this now, I've said this from the beginning. There was never anything such as a revived Roman empire. Doesn't exist, never existed, never will. It's a misunderstanding of scripture. What there is instead is a revived Babylonian empire. Interesting. So you'll recall Nebuchadnezzar's statue, right? Starts out with a gold head, and then it leads to the 10 toes, which are the final form of the Roman empire, right? Babylonia was destroyed historically, went away, right? But at the end of the tribulation week, what city gets destroyed? Mystery Babylon. That is the city that rules over the kings of the earth, right? That is the city destroyed right before Armageddon in Revelation 19. Mystery, Babylon. That is the city that rules over the kings of the earth under the Antichrist, right? So what does that mean? There's a revived Babylonian empire. And the final form of the Roman empire, where these 10 toes, these 10 kings actually come on the scene, where the global government is constituted, that is nothing less than the revived Babylonian empire that has come, to, come out of the Roman empire. It's the final form of the Roman empire, but it's also a revived Babylonian empire. For them to then go now, right before he becomes king, and particularly if we're already in the tribulation week, approaching the great tribulation, you know, which if we are already in the tribulation week, that would mean the great tribulation will start less than two years from now. Okay, which less is then than two three, years. which is then three and a half years. Right, three and a half years from the start of the seven years, if we're in the tribulation week, and I don't know if we are yet. But regardless, for it to be at this point in history before he becomes king, to now say, we're reconstituting the Tower of Babel, we're putting Lucifer as the all-seeing eye, the king over this whole thing, and we and you are to worship through Molech, this bull idol. And here's the other clincher. Moses came out down off Mount Sinai with the initial set of tablets to find Israel had built, had reconstituted that bull, the golden calf. It's the same thing. It was the Aphis bull of Egypt, the same thing as Molech for Molech and Baal, you know, like Ra and Aphis for Egypt. Okay. Same thing. Moses comes down off Mount Sinai with God's commandments and finds Israel worshiping this thing. Right. Throws down these commandments and judgment follows, right? disgusted with Israel. It's so serious that God is ready to annihilate Israel from the face of the planet and make a new nation out of Moses, right? And Moses intercedes and says, no, Lord, take my life too, if you're going to do this. Otherwise, why have you brought this people out of Egypt only to have your name, you know, mocked, spoken against among the nations because you brought them out and couldn't bring them, you know, all the way to the promised land. You had to kill them in the wilderness because they were so wicked right? You couldn't deliver, in other words. If you're going to do that, kill me too. So Moses interceded in the ultimate way before God. And so God changed his mind and judged the nation of Israel, right? And ultimately gave new Ten Commandments. Okay, so here Moses was a type of Christ, right? So for the moment here, we're going to put Moses in the place of Christ. Moses was a type of Christ. You know, he's the, there's a prophet like him who would arise in Israel. That's the Messiah right? Okay. So the Antichrist is a counterfeit of Christ. Therefore, he's also a counterfeit of Moses, right? Right. So here's Prince Charles. At the beginning of this event, the bull hasn't been brought out yet, not unveiled. The bull is brought out. 
then these runners that have traveled, you know, these athletes that have traveled through all the nations the prior year, bring this baton, which is shaped like a torch to Prince Charles. And this is after all this stuff has happened around this bowl. And Prince Charles has been overseeing the whole thing. They bring this torch and they open the top of the torch and a little scroll is pulled out of the torch. And the lady who's over the Commonwealth Games unscrolls it, hands it to Prince Charles, and he reads it as a message from his mother to bless the event. This is like the Ten Commandments. This is the counterfeit in this case. Moses coming off the mountain, Prince Charles overseeing this event. Moses seeing Israel worshiping the golden calf and being furious, you know, and casting down the Ten Commandments. Prince Charles seeing the nations, worshiping the Molech ball. Not being furious, saying, oh, hey, let me bless this from the queen. And after that is when, right after that is when the bull raises up on its heel, the tower is fully raised, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer is reconstituted over the thing, and the beam of light goes between the bull's chest and that ball over the tower, the all-seeing eye. Prince Charles oversaw that whole thing. It's like saying, now you can worship the devil and we'll achieve our aim of finally building the Tower of Babel and putting Lucifer as our God, our king. And here's one last thing. You know, when they put the idol on the Temple Mount and it represents Jupiter or Zeus at the start of the Great Tribulation, guess where the devil is at that point? And by the way, remember, it's got Prince Charles' face. That idol does. Guess where the devil is at that point? He's possessing Prince Charles. He's entered him. You know, the devil entered Judas Iscariot before he went to betray Christ. He possessed him. The devil will enter Prince Charles before he goes to betray Israel. Christ was crucified after the betrayal by Judas. Israel will be betrayed, and the church will be betrayed by Prince Charles after, he, after uh, he's entered by the devil. There are two individuals in Scripture only who are called the son of perdition and the son of destruction. Judas Iscariot was one. He was the son of perdition and the son of destruction in the context of the crucifixion week. The other one is the Antichrist, who is the son of perdition or the son of destruction in the context of the tribulation week. Judas betrayed Christ, God's firstborn son. The Antichrist will betray uh, Israel, not just Christ, but Israel, corporately as God's firstborn son. And so the great tribulation will ensue. And not just Israel, but those of us who are believers led as lambs to the slaughter, like Christ was led to the cross. The church will go through the whole tribulation week. And I talk about this in my real rapture material. There's a whole volume in the Messiah history and the tribulation period coming on that. But there's also teaching available in CD and DVD through Prophecy House called the real rapture, proving very easily, very easily that the rapture is post-trib. And I have presented this journey to churches and, the, and whole churches have changed from pre-trib to post-trib like that who were convinced it was pre-trib when they were shown this material. It's very easy to show. The, it just as it's easy to show who the Antichrist is, but all these people who are listening to you and they, they're saying, wow, I've never heard this before. How come I've never heard any of this probably before? Why has my pastor, you know, not been talking about this or looking into this? Why has this information been suppressed after being out for two and a half decades, almost since 1998? in a book as a bestseller. Why isn't the whole church just up in arms over this until now? Yeah, yeah, right? it's just right, this big and so, blindness. And it's the same situation with the rapture. You know, when you see the evidence and how to actually identify the Antichrist and how literally fulfilled scripture is around all of that, beyond all imagination, you know, even the whole church pretty much looked at Revelation 13 historically and said it could only be metaphorical or metaphysical. Nothing like that exists in nature. And then more recently, they said, well, maybe it'll be some genetic chimera, uh, chimera, I mean, that'll be produced by mankind and worship, right? That's as far as anyone's been able to go until the real thing is shown, meaning the imagery actually exists. And so here's the same situation. When Prince Charles is possessed by the devil and that idol is placed on the Temple Mount, it's Satan on the Temple Mount in the body of Prince Charles as Zeus slash Jupiter that idol. Um, so, you know, um, I want people to know where they can get their, your materials, Tim, because you have so many incredible books. Uh, please give your website and also the original, the book 
that we originally Sid interviewed you on 1998 and now the second edition is coming out is the Antichrist and a cup of tea but uh, give your website and other materials that they can get on your website. Yes, thank you. Uh, Prophecy House is the publisher. The site is prophecyhouse.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, house.com. So Prophecy House is one word, dot com. And uh, there's the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War, Behold a Red Horse, a multi-volume series coming, uh, initially titled Israel, quote unquote, Peace in the Coming World War, The Great Tribulation is Near. Uh, that's going to probably be retitled before publication, but that complements North Korea, Iran in the coming world war, but from a Israel-centric, many-centric vantage point and showing how Israel is going to be nationally crucified. That's what the Great Tribulation really is as God's firstborn son. So as Christ, as God's firstborn son, was physically crucified on the cross, and by the way, crucifixion originated not in Rome, it originated in Persia, historically, Iran. Wow. So Israel is going to be nationally crucified and Iran is going to have a lot to do with that, with the destruction of Israel and the start of the Great Tribulation and the successful attack against Israel where half the city is taken captive, half of Jerusalem is taken captive in the war by force. Iran is going to have a lot to do with kicking that off and bringing that to pass. The national crucifixion of Israel. The Romans, of course, too, under the Antichrist, Prince Charles, King Charles III. So... There's that. There's a book coming on the Exodus from ancient Israel. You know, much of modern Israel doesn't even believe in the historicity of the Exodus. And so they even question their own right to the land. They question God's promises. You know, most of Israel is secular. They don't understand that the history is real because even their own archaeologists are fools, many of them, and they discount God's promises. They discount the actual historicity of the Exodus that it happened when scripture says it happened that it happened how it happened, that the pharaohs are who scripture says they were, that they actually lived in the right time frame, et cetera. So in this book, I'm identifying who the actual pharaohs were with concrete evidence. I've identified all but one of them, and even that one I've probably correctly identified with the correct chronology. So one of the volumes in another series of mine, which is titled Messiah History in the Tribulation Period that I started while still at the academy, but that's the series that shows all the weeks of scripture are patterned after the crucifixion week, including the tribulation week, meaning when Christ was crucified as God's firstborn son at the midpoint of the crucifixion week, so Wednesday, not a Thursday or a Friday, and resurrected at the end of that week, God was looking at the saints martyred and persecuted at the midpoint of the week of history until now, meaning the fourth millennium until now, and then martyred and crucified and killed, you know, slaughtered, etc. In the Great Tribulation, starting in the fourth year of the Tribulation Week. So when Christ was dying on the cross, we died with him. That isn't just a statement of scripture. It's not just metaphorical. It's metaphysical. We joined his body by the Holy Spirit. We're being crucified with him. When he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. And this is Israel too. I'll come back to that. When he rose at the end of that week, after a full three days and three nights, not a piece of a day, calling it a day and night, right? a full three days and three nights. Uh, so Thursday evening, Thursday day, Friday evening, Friday day, Friday day, Saturday evening, Saturday day, resurrected at the end of the weekly Sabbath to be seen by the women the next morning at the tomb, hours after he'd already risen. Okay? When he rose, we rise in him. So there's a resurrection at the end of the tribulation week. That's what attends the rapture, precedes it at Christ's return. There's a resurrection at the end of the week of history, the great white throne judgment. Three deaths, crucifixions, deaths, burials, three resurrections between those three major weeks. So the series is called Messiah, History, and the Tribulation Period for the Crucifixion Week, the uh, Week of History, and the Tribulation Week, the three major weeks of Scripture patterned after the Crucifixion Week. I mention that only to say this. That's probably going to be my final thing that I publish or close to it. But there's, uh, and the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea was just a large appendix to that. But the point is, all this stuff, you can take those weeks and harmonize them. And the final volume of that series is called The Harmony of Weeks. But there's also a complete volume on biblical chronology, where I show we're near the year 6,000 now. The millennial kingdom is the seventh day, the seventh 1,000 year period, the actual Sabbath millennium of history. And that's why Hebrews 4 says that we're going to enter a Sabbath rest with Christ's return, the saints do. 
It's a reference to the Sabbath millennium, the seventh day of the week of history. Not just the fact that we're entering into God's kingdom and spiritual rest. It's more than that. So at any rate, the point is, I can tell you we're near the year 6,000. I can correctly place the chronology for Israel's ancient history and the pharaohs and identify them on that basis because it is the most accurate biblical chronology ever done, bar none. It's the, also the only one done to have a mathematical margin of error. That's how accurate it is. And I can tell you we're near the year 6,000 now, which means we're nearing the tribulation week, if not already in it at this point. That's the last seven years before the year 6,000 is uh, concluded. So the millennial kingdom starts at the end of the year 6,000. The tribulation week starts seven years before that. But there's a mathematical margin of error, so we're not to the day or the month with it, or the week even. Tim, thank you so much for all the information. And again, um, everyone, you can go on prophecyhouse.com to look for his book and his not just, well, the one book that we were talking about of the Antichrist in a cup of tea, but all the other books and materials he was talking about on Bible prophecy and what he was just uh, explaining. The materials are endless and they're so extensive. Um, I want you to share this video and please subscribe. And also I'd like you to comment on what you think of all of the information that Tim explained. Thank you.